welcome to tax for gh and welcome to our next video in the international taxation series in this video we continue to um, delve deeper into the concept of permanent establishment or pe um, which you must know if you have to even um, begin to say you know any bit of international tax so please pay attention carefully and watch through to the end as we we'll give you a very good understanding of all the rules around permanent establishments in general we we'll also talk about foreign tax credits that will arise um, as a result of double taxation and i will end with the methods that you can use to relieve double taxes du double taxes paid what does the law say about pe's or permanent establishments um, we said in the previous video about recap that a pe is an entity separate from its owner and will be subject to tax in the same manner as a resident company if the pe is a Ghanaian pe and we defined a Ghanaian PE in the previous video. So we're saying that as long as you are a Ghanaian PE, then you'll be subject to tax in the same manner as a resident company. So being a PE or being deemed to have triggered a Ghanaian PE is a big deal because you treat you in the same manner as a Ghanaian resident company. The next that we're saying in accordance with section 111, subsection 2, which is on the right, we're saying that that PE will be exempt um, from tax if that PE is situated outside Ghana. So if you look at 1112, it deals with, on the right, we're saying that the income of a resident individual from employment exercised in a foreign country, A, with a non-resident employer, or B, with a resident employer, where the individual is present in the foreign country for 183 days or more, continue this, obviously, will be deemed to be exempt from tax. I'm saying that in accordance with this section, then the PE will be exempt from tax if that PE is situated outside Ghana. I'm saying also that in accordance with the above, we just mentioned these two principles, the income of the PE and any tax liability for the PE is computed as if that PE and its owner were separate but are persons in a controlled relationship. We will define controlled relationship in our advanced income taxation series and we are saying that will also be computed as if that PE is a resident person in Ghana in which or in the country which is situated so I said when it comes to PE we will deem the owner of the PE and the PE itself to be separate persons and also as persons who are in a controlled relationship and we'll say that will compute their tax liability as if that PE is a person resident in Ghana um, for the year of assessment as the case may be. Remember this, um, it's very, very important. What else must you know by way of principles of taxation for PEs? I'm saying that part eight of the Income Tax Act, which deals with tax payment procedure, the one that talks about withholding taxes and all of that, would apply directly to a Ghanaian PE separate from its owner. So all the rules, like I said, that deal with a resident company would apply to a Ghanaian PE. And we are saying the arrangement between a PE and its owner will be recognized for the purpose of what the income tax acts will, will legitimize them, will allow or recognize all such arrangements. Also, a Ghanaian PE shall, in compliance with part 8, which deals with tax payment procedure, the rules around withholding taxes, the rules around them, um, tax on assessment, all of those things, which we covered into details in our withholding tax video, in our um, video on advanced income taxes and all of that. We said a Ghanaian PE shall withhold tax from a payment made by that PE in the same way as a resident company making payments will do in a similar circumstance. Remember the underlying principle is that a Ghanaian PE will be treated in the same way as a resident company. So here we are just reiterating the fact but a Ghanaian PE must also withhold tax from any payments they make in the same way that a resident company would have done. The next is that the Ghanaian PE must pay withholding tax on any payment received by that PE in the same way as a resident company receiving that payment will do in a similar circumstance. And so in this second point, we are saying that people must also withhold on you in the same manner they would have withheld on a resident company. And finally, we are saying that the Ghanaian PE must also pay tax by installments 
after assessment in the same circumstances as a resident company. So the same way as a resident company is subject to what quarterly installment payments of taxes, the same will apply to a PE. So once you become a PE, we treat you as though you are just like a resident company. The next is we are saying the arrangements specified in section 1093, which is on the right, as between a Ghanaian PE and its non-resident owner are recognized under the Income Tax Act. So what arrangement do we have under 1093? Let's take a look at that. I say in addition to the circumstances specified in section 38, which deals with realization of assets and liabilities, and 39, which modifies the principles for realization of assets to liabilities really. I say in a PE is considered as having realized an asset held by that PE or a liability owed by that PE when the asset or liability ceases to be an asset or a liability of that PE. So we are saying that where a PE has an asset or a liability and that asset or liability ceases to be owned or owed by the PE, then we would deem that asset or liability to be realized and the rules for realization under 38 and section 39 will apply. And we covered this into very significant detail under our taxation of gains and gifts video. You can look at the rules around that if you want to take a look at that. That says subject to part three of the Income Tax Act, which deals with rules governing amounts used in calculating the income tax base. Where these rules apply, the following entries are recognized if shown in the same manner in the account of the owner and the PE. What are the entries? One, any debt which is owed by the owner to the PE or a debt owed by the PE to the owner and any interest derived or incurred with respect to the debt obligation. We are saying that if the owner owes the PE any amount of debt or if the PE owns the owner of the PE any amount of debt or they've incurred interest or derived interest with respect to this debt, we are saying that we'll recognize this amount exactly the way it is in the books of account. So will legitimize any transaction between owner and PE. They are saying that but a debt owned by the owner to a third party is not attributable to the PE. So if the owner of the PE owes a third party any debt, we are saying we cannot attribute that debt to the PE. But apart from that, any direct debt between owner of PE and PE will be legitimized and taken into account for the purpose of the Income Tax Act. Let's look at activities, assets, and liabilities of a PE and the rules around this. As saying that an activity of a PE is treated as conducted in the course of a single business. This is a common concept that runs through the Income Tax Act for different business and entity types. Also, an activity of a PE is that activity conducted by the owner through the PE. So if the owner of a PE conducts any activity through the PE, then that activity conducted by the owner will be deemed to be an activity of the PE. Also, without limiting the effects of the two things I just mentioned, the following activities are treated as conducted by a Ghanaian PE. What are the activities? One, when the owner employs an individual who is resident in Ghana, we are deeming this to have been conducted by the PE. So if the owner employs anybody who is resident in Ghana, that activity or that act of employing someone will be deemed to have been conducted by the PE. Take note. The next is when the owner makes a sale of trading stock of the same or a similar kind as those sold through the PE, then this transaction is also be deemed as what carried out by the PE. And any other business activity of the owner, which is of the same or similar kind as that of that is affected through the PE conducted with a person resident in Ghana would also be deemed as an activity of the PE. What else should we know under this um, principle? I think the asset or liability of a PE is one, an asset held by or to the extent employed in an activity of the PE. So any asset that a PE holds or any asset that's employed in an activity of the PE is deemed to be an asset of the PE. The next is any intangible asset which is created by or created through the PE is also an asset of the PE. In the case of a Ghanaian PE, however, an intangible asset to the extent that they may be exploited in Ghana is also deemed to be an asset of the PE. 
So if the Ghanaian PE has any intangible assets and that asset can be exploited in Ghana, then we deem that intangible to be an asset of the PE for tax purposes. Then also subject to section 1075, which is on the right, I'll show you shortly, a debt obligation incurred in borrowing money to the extent that the money is employed in an activity of the PE or used to acquire an asset referred to in the first bullet above, which is an asset held by or to the extent employed in the activity of the PE, that debt obligation will be deemed to be a liability of the PE. What does 1075 say? I say in the following entries are recognized if shown in the same manner in the account of the P. So this is what we, we looked at in the previous um, slide where we said that a debt owned by the owner to the PE or a debt owed by the PE to the owner will be deemed to be what um, recognized in the same manner um, for the purpose of the PE. The same for what any interest derived or interest in care. So you've seen this um, already. The final thing which would be a liability of the PE is any other liability that arises directly out of an activity of the PE. So these are rules around activities deemed to be conducted by the PE, whether or not done by the owner, then what the law deems to be an asset of a PE or a liability of a PE. Let's look next at the income or loss of a PE. What does the law deem to be a PE's income or a PE's loss for tax purposes? As in the person calculating the income of a PE from its business shall attribute the income of the PE a number of things. So if you are computing a PE's income or accessible income for the year, you are required to attribute to the PE some amount of income. The first is any amount derived by that PE in respect of an asset held by that PE, a liability owed by that PE or any other activity of that PE. So if a PE owns an asset or holds an asset, owes a liability or conducts any other activity, then any amounts derived from these things, whether the asset ownership, the liability owning or owing, I mean, and any other activity will also be what included in the income or attributed to the PE. The next is any payment received by that PE in respect of an asset held by that PE, any liability owed by that PE or any activity of that PE must also be what attributed to the PE for the purpose of what determining their income. Also, any expenditure incurred and any payment made for the purpose of asset held by the PE, liabilities owed by that PE, or any other activity of that PE to the extent that the expenditure is properly recorded in the account of the PE will also be taken into account in determining the income or loss of that PE. What else will go into determining the income or loss of a PE? As in a PE acquires an asset when the ownership rights of the asset is transferred by the previous owner to that PE. So this is really common sense. Um, a PE will be deemed to have acquired an asset when the ownership rights of the asset is transferred from the previous owner to the PE. This will be the same in every everyday transaction. Or a PE in case of liability when the liability is a liability of the PE or when the liability becomes a liability of the PE, we say the PE has incurred a liability. In addition to the circumstances in section 38, which is realization, and 39, which we just spoke about, which is modification of the rules um, for liabilities, I saying the PE is considered as having realized an asset held by that PE or a liability owed by that PE when the asset or liability ceases to be an asset or liability of the PE. So in the same manner, when a PE owns an asset and they cease to own that asset, or if a PE owes a liability and they cease to owe that liability, then we deem the asset or the liability to have been realized by the PE. Now let's look at the rules for foreign source of income of a resident person and what the rules are. So let's look at um, the principles around foreign source of income of a resident person. What does the law say? These are very essential, very straightforward, very easy to understand. First thing to take home is that the income of the resident person derived from a foreign source is taxable. Take note. This is where we begin to get the basis when someone says Ghana operates a worldwide um, system of taxation. 
worldwide because we are saying that the income of a resident person derived from a foreign source is taxable. So as long as you are resident, your foreign source income is taxable in addition to your what, locally sourced income. This is why we say Ghana has a worldwide system of taxation. We are saying despite the above, the income of a resident individual from employment exercised in a foreign country with a non-resident employer or with a resident employer where the individual is present in the foreign country for 183 continuous days or more during the year of assessment is exempt from tax. So what does this mean? We are saying that despite the fact that the income of a resident person derived from a foreign source is taxable, when it comes to employment income, there will be some possible exemption on two conditions. Either the employment is exercised as a non-resident employer or exercised as a resident employer but the individual is present in the foreign country for 183 continuous days or more, then that income will be exempt from tax. Also, the minister may, by way of legislative instruments, make regulations to prescribe a number of things. One, the criteria for exempting from tax the income of a foreign pe and PE and the foreign income of a resident person. The next is circumstances in which the income of a foreign PE is not exempt but is taxable in the hands of a resident owner with a foreign tax credit and circumstances in which the income of a foreign trust or company that is controlled by residents is attributed and taxed the members of that trust or company. As I speak today, the current regulations we have, which is LI2244, do not, it does not cover any of these three things. So we don't know when these regulations will come out. But just know that the law provides that the minister, the finance minister really, um, can make regulations to prescribe any of these things that we don't have them as of today. Let's talk about foreign tax credits. Very important. What do you need to know about this? So in a resident person, other than a partnership, if you watched our video on the taxation of partnerships and trust, we established this principle clearly by repeating it here again. I seen a resident person other than a partnership may claim a foreign tax credit for a year of assessment for any income tax paid by that person to a foreign country and to the extent to which that income tax is paid with respect to accessible income of that person for the year or the accessible foreign income of that person for the year. So we are saying that everybody apart from a partnership may, not shall, may claim a foreign tax credit for a year of assessment for any tax they've paid in a foreign country with respect to their accessible foreign income. So if you've paid a tax in a foreign country, you may be entitled towards a credit for that tax in Ghana. A foreign tax credit claimed is to be calculated separately for each year of assessment and separately for accessible foreign income from each employment, business or investment. And with respect to each calculation, that foreign tax credit claimed may not exceed the average rate of Ghanaian income tax of the person for the year applied to the accessible income or accessible foreign income of that person. I say now when it comes to foreign income, long story short, when we apply the average rate of Ghanaian income tax to your income, whatever you were supposed to pay locally, you will get a credit higher than that. In other words, your foreign tax credit will not exceed your average Ghana tax payable. So let's say if we apply Ghana tax to that income, you're going to pay a thousand dollars. Your foreign tax credit will not exceed thousand dollars. Whether whether you have a foreign tax credit of thousand five, three thousand, we'll cap it at the local tax credit amount. It's a credit anyways. It's not a refund. So if you are giving me a credit, you can have more than you would have had if you are paying that amount in Ghana. Don't forget that in any case, your foreign source income is taxable in Ghana. So if I'm giving you a tax credit, you shouldn't come and tell me that. I owe you money or you want a refund. It's a credit, it's not a refund. Now, saying the person may elect to relinquish a foreign tax credit available for a year of assessment and instead claim a deduction for that amount of income tax paid to the foreign country. But otherwise, a deduction is not available for income tax paid to a foreign country. So, as you find out shortly, um, we have the exemption method, we have the credit method. And have the deduction method of relieving double taxation. 
what our law is saying here is that you may elect to relinquish or lose or let go or forego your foreign tax credit available for a year of assessment and instead claim a deduction for the amount of income tax paid to the foreign country but apart from that you are not entitled to a deduction the default is really the credit method in Ghana now that we know this what else do we need to know by way of definition? We are saying the average rate of Ghanaian income tax of a resident person for a year of assessment means the percentage that tax payable by that person under section 11A, which imposes income tax, calculated under section 13, without subtraction of any foreign tax credit, is of the chargeable income of that person for the year. Long story short, it is tax payable according to Ghana's tax laws divided by chargeable income for the year that's all that's what we are saying that that's the um, fraction how to determine the average rate it's tax payable divided by chargeable income really what well, how does the law define accessible foreign income you can guess anyways it means what the foreign source income included in accessible income of a resident person for a year of assessment from the employment business or investment of the resident person as the case requires now that we know all of these about foreign tax credit, what does the income tax regulation say? We've been looking at what the Income Tax Act says. What does the income tax regulation um, say about foreign tax credit? It says in accordance with section 112, which we just looked at anyways, a resident person, a resident taxpayer, shall be allowed a credit for the foreign taxes paid in a foreign country in the year of assessment in which the income corresponding to the tax has been assessed to tax in the country so we are saying that we'll do a matching concept here when the amount is assessed or subjected to tax in ghana it is that month or that year that you can claim the corresponding tax credit also a resident taxpayer will be allowed a foreign tax credit relief after submitting to the commissioner general a tax credit certificate an official receipt or a functional equivalent of a tax credit certificate from the tax department of the foreign country specifying the nature of income and the quantum of taxes deducted or paid by the taxpayer but saying that here when you want a tax credit you can't just walk to GRA and say I paid this amount give us documentary evidence show us a foreign tax credit relief show us a credit certificate if you pay taxes show us the receipt of taxes you paid in the foreign country or any functional equivalent of any document from that country's tax authority that proves that indeed you have paid taxes in that country and you are entitled to a credit in Ghana so remember that you you, you need to begin you need to show proof of the foreign tax you paid now that we know what the local legislation has says let's let, let's come back to um, what international tax provides or the rules of international tax remember I told you that we have two main forms of double taxation. If you watch part one of this video series, we said there's economic double taxation and there's what juridical double taxation. We said that a juridical double taxation had three main methods of elimination of double taxation. We had the deduction method, we had the credit method, and we had the exemption method. Let's look at these into some level of detail and then we can um, wrap up with some other principles. So what does the deduction method mean? What does it stand for? We are saying that under the deduction method, the country of residence taxes its residents on their worldwide income, but they allow them to take a deduction for foreign taxes paid in the computation of their taxable income. Take note, this is a deduction. So the same way when you compute your income, you deduct capital allowance, you deduct repairs and improvements, you deduct research and development expenditure, you deduct all those type of expenses. We are saying that we we'll allow you to deduct the foreign tax credit or you have to deduct the foreign tax paid as an expenditure before we apply your tax so take note deduction method is we give you that amount as a deduction when we are determining your tax for the year foreign taxes will therefore be treated as what costs or current expense of doing business or earning income in a foreign jurisdiction this is the least generous method for granting relief from international double taxation and i'll tell you why don't forget that when it comes to deductions, when we grant the deduction, you get a tax and um, a profit figure, and it is that profit figure that we apply the tax rates to. So, 
the effect of this will be the least the least you feel because whatever amount you are given as a, a credit will end up being taxed so the impact you feel is a tax effect so let's say if you have a general company in Ghana, then 25% of that deduction is what you effectively enjoy. So that's why we are saying that this is the least generous method for granting relief from international double tax. Although this method is not foreseen or put in perspective by the OECD and the UN model convention, it is used by several countries that apply the credit method as a way of dealing with foreign taxes that do not qualify for foreign tax credit such as foreign stamp duty. So you realize that even in our law, and as much as the law is focusing on the credit method, they made some room for what a deduction method of some sort, even though the default is what's a credit method. I think that it also creates a bias in favor of domestic investing as it is not neutral with respect to the allocation of resources between countries. So it doesn't favor um, doing business outside the territory. You rather, it's better you do your business in Ghana and in your country. So here we have two concepts called um, capital import neutrality and capital export neutrality. At this your level, um, don't bother too much. We'll treat it in the advanced, complicated international tax videos. So just know that um, this is the deduction method and how does it work? You get a deduction as an expense in arriving at your um, taxable income for the period. This is the least generous method. And the OECD and UN model conventions do not even prescribe this. They focus more on the credit method and the exemption method. Now that we know that, let's look at the exemption method. What do we need to know under this? For exemption method, as the name implies, the country of residence taxes their residents on their domestic source income and completely exempts them from their domestic tax on their foreign source and foreign source income. So the exemption method completely eliminates the resident source international double taxation. Remember how we started? We said we have three main forms of juridical double taxation. It's either residence, residence, source, source, or residence, source. We are saying that if you use the exemption method, then to eliminate the residence source international double taxation. Remember, exemption method, as the name implies, your country of residence will tax you on your domestic source income and then forget about the foreign source one. They will exempt you from tax from that one. However, there are two main types of the exemption method. There is the full exemption method and there is the exemption with progression. I'll run through these quickly because um, at your level, you need to know the types, but the details don't bother. But the full exemption method, as the name implies, we are saying the whole income which is taxed in the source state is exempt. That it is not taken into account at all by the resident state for tax purposes. In determining the tax on the rest of the income in the resident state, the income taxable in the source country is still not taken into consideration. So if you are under the full exemption method, full exemption means full exemption. We don't even consider that foreign source income at all. But under the exemption with progression method, I think the whole income which is taxed in the source or foreign state will be exempt all right i.e. not taken into account by the state of residence. However, in determining the tax on the rest of the income in the state of residence, the income taxable in the source state will be taken into account as in this will be relevant in the case of progressive taxes or progressive rate. So exemption with progression, we have still exempted you by determining your tax payable locally, we might take into account the foreign tax you've paid in determining your effective tax rate or effective tax payable locally. So just know, don't bother too much. And the exemption method, we have two main forms, full exemption and exemption with progression. We will have a detailed video on this to explain. Now let's look at the credit method. Um, Ghana's, Ghana's method of eliminating double tax. I think that the residence country provides its resident taxpayers with a credit for income taxes they've paid to a foreign country against their residence country taxes otherwise payable. So here we give you a credit, pay your tax all right, determine your tax your tax payable, then we give you a credit for what you've paid. So here obviously we include your foreign source income because it's taxable. Find your tax payable, then we grant you a credit for the foreign one you paid. Take note. So this one you're not exempted. The amount is included in determining your taxable income in Ghana and then any credit you paid foreign-wise will be given to you as a deduction. 
or a reduction, a credit from the tax payable. There are two main types of um, credit method. We have the full credit and the ordinary credit. Under the full credit method, the resident state will provide their resident taxpayers with a credit for the total amount of taxes paid with no limit. Then we have the ordinary credit approach where there will be limits on the amount of credit you get. So Ghana um, operates a mixture of the two because no Ghana said we will not give you any credit above what the average Ghana tax rate or the average amount you have paid from the Ghana perspective. So under the ordinary credit, you really have three main perspectives or three main angles. The overall or worldwide limitation, the country by country or per country limitation, and the item by item limitation. You can hit the pause button and read through these if you um, want the details, but just know that at your level, nobody's going to bother you with these types um, of the ordinary credit method. So that's it um, by way of um, this introductory series to international taxation. Let's, let's just pause here. Um, this has covered everything you need to know when it comes to international tax at the basic level. Um, the next time we approach international tax will be in our series on the advanced concepts where we look at um, the history of double taxation agreement. We look at the detailed concepts. We pick each article of the model tax agreement and we delve into it in detail. So we have a full series of videos on Article 4 on residence, a full series on Article 5 on PE, a full series on all the articles, a full series on transfer pricing, all of those international tax concepts. So be on the lookout for those. So for now, um, let's end the series here. If you love this video, don't forget to smash the like button. Please do so. And don't forget to share this video within your entire network. I'll catch you in our next video. Thank you.